Welcome to the Dirty Verdict Podcast, where your hosts, trial lawyer Kyle Herbert and mediator Peter Tom, break down Texas legal news, lawsuits, and verdicts. And now, here's Kyle and Peter. All right, welcome to the next edition of The Dirty Verdict with mediator Peter Taff and trial lawyer Kyle Herbert. Uh, usually, or most of the time, we were talking about Texas law cases, Houston cases, uh, or stories about them. Uh, this week, we have a special guest. Kyle, why don't you introduce our special guest? Peter, thanks very much. Also, good to be back with you. It's been a couple of weeks. I hope you are well. We are here today with William Bill Ogden. From the firm of Farah and Ball, or Castor Lynch, Farah and Ball, here in Houston. I don't know what the full appropriate name is, Bill. What what is it? So, technically, I work for both. You do work for both. Yeah, when we merged, we merged with an older firm from Florida about six years ago, um, and they did pretty much exclusively auto products liability work. And so, all the auto products cases go into that one, and then all the stuff. All the stuff that we do, uh, all the other stuff goes into the fair and ball. Regardless, probably soon it'll be Ogden and Associates, and Peter and I are both hoping to be your first hires. Ogden and Sons. Ogden and Sons. That's an oil and lube shop. (laughs) We're looking forward to that. So I've known Bill for, I don't know, five, ten years, uh, and he's been doing some real interesting work that we thought would be real interesting to chat about. Also, Bill's firm is a repeat player here at The Dirty Verdict. We've we've had some of his uh, co-workers, co-counsel, the infamous Mark Bankston from the InfoWars trial. Uh, That might be a fun place for us to start. Uh, Tell us, give us the two-minute synopsis of what happened in the InfoWars trial, and then maybe let's chat a little bit about uh, what the new developments are with uh, Mr. Alex Jones and the InfoWars jam. Two minutes. Uh, So InfoWars was the funniest case I've ever done uh, by far. For two and a half years, Mark and I litigated the case in discovery and got sanctions order after sanctions order. One swept, Mark, not me, swept all the appeals uh, all the way up to the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, we tried to get, they got default liability. Uh, they got default judgment in, on liability. So we tried the case in August of 2022. Wait, one sec. Yeah. So this is the case arising out of Alex Jones, InfoWars, podcast, you know, however he's out there defaming the parents of the Sandy Hook victims, suggesting that they're crisis actors in addition to a bunch of other terrible stuff. Is that accurate? Correct. So okay. the, the Heslin was the case specifically, and Alex Jones and his team uh, stated on the air multiple times that Neil Heslin did not hold his dead son. Gotcha. Um, and so that was... You know, Mr. Heslin and Mrs. Heslin were your clients in the trial in Austin. Uh, Miss Wrestling, Miss Lewis, yes. Mom and dad of, of Jesse. Got so, it. Um, case was super fun during Discovery. Uh, we got to try out every deposition tactic that we've ever wanted. Most of them are completely unethical and probably shouldn't have been done. But the lawyers just, it was a revolving door. Every, one would come in, get sanctioned, leave. New one would come in, say, I'm not that guy or girl. Um, I'm, str- I'm a straight shooter. And I've got Mr. Jones under control. We're going to get this thing resolved. We're working on it. I'll clean up this mess. They got sanctioned. Here comes a new one. So I think the the trial lawyers uh, that tried the case, I think were numbers 11 and 12 on the case. And the only one that they replaced Brad Reeves, who I think was the only defense lawyer. He's a younger guy out of Austin. He was the only one that didn't get sanctioned, I don't think. And he was the only one that I actually... I didn't trust him, but I don't trust anybody on the other side, but I didn't think he was a bad person. And I think he actually tried as hard as he could, but he inherited such a mess that he stood no chance. So you guys tried this game uh, case against uh, Mr. Jones and InfoWars. Uh, What what was that? Six, eight months ago? Uh, Yeah. August, early August, 2022. Uh, It was a week before my birthday. So it had been fifth through the eighth ish. And you got a verdict. 49.3 million. In addition to, I guess, some sanctions that happened before that. Yeah, we already had, I think, $1.5 million in the bank that they'd already paid in sanctions. Uh, I think they've gotten another million at least uh, since trial with sanctions. Uh, there's one big for the trial conduct that happened. And a lot of people that watch, there's a lot of people that watched it on YouTube. Um, they didn't get to see everything that was actually happening in there, but there was a lot of trial conduct that should not have happened after multiple warnings. And so I think Judge Garrett's going to have another one on her hands. And then they just filed a brief last night 
for a motion for a new trial that's full of just errors and inaccuracies. And so I, at this point, they just can't seem to get it right. Is their current appellate counsel the same as the lawyers that tried it in Austin? No. And I, I, could, I stopped trying to even learn people's names. I know Andino ran all. He was the trial counsel sure. for Mr. Jones. Um, but I, I didn't even try to learn the new one's names because I figured they'd be gone in a month and a half. So, so you guys try your case in Austin. You get a $47 million verdict. And then the InfoWars trial team immediately flies up to, was it New York? Connecticut. To, they, Conne- in, yeah, in Newtown, I believe. So they fly up to Connecticut to start trial number two. Yeah, so there was, at the same time our case was going on, there was a case in Connecticut with nine parents, well, nine family members. Some of them weren't parents. They were, there was an FBI agent who'd been defamed and some other things. Um, We litigated on the same path and it was, we all worked together because we all wanted the same thing, which we got even before the trial, which was to make it stop. Um, But then he went and had to face the music in Connecticut and a Travis County jury was that hits him with 49.3 million is actually pretty timid next to a Connecticut jury for nine versus two clients. So it was, it was bigger, but uh, they hit him up for 965 million, 965 million. Yeah. And then I think their punitive award put him over a billion. So have you calculated like how much, how many supplements you have to sell to get $965 million? I did it even way more fun for every dollar I put one of the supplements in a jar. And now my entire living room is full of pieces of, of pills. Is it alpha brain, gorilla brain? What's it called? It's called the, the red pill. Uh, it's great. It's got some lead paint in there. It's crushed up concrete. You're going to run through brick walls. Yeah. Uh, you get the good stuff from Japan. I believe. Was the oh quote. God. Yeah. He was talking about his, his, uh, his knockoff Viagra. He's saying ours is the best stuff. We, you get extra uh, aroused. We'll call it since, you know, all right. S- settle down, Bill. Uh, Not me. I didn't take it. Okay. So uh, real quick, I saw that there was a sanction order I thought entered in the (coughs) Connecticut court about three weeks or a month ago uh, against trial counsel because they had uh, Andino Ray Nall in addition to another lawyer. Norm Pattis. Norman Pattis. Yeah. He's got kind of a, what's the, he's got a real interesting reputation up there in the Northeast. What's, what's his jam? So he's a civil rights lawyer and he actually is a, he tries cases, but his, the problem with Norm is he's hosted InfoWars. While we were in the case, he was on the show in person multiple times. He's hosted it by himself before. Um, and I don't know what happened, but he was kind of on, a, you know, I'm not gonna say Mount Rushmore, but he had a star in Hollywood. Um, uh, as far as like civil rights lawyers, his pedigree was pretty good. And then I, I guess towards the end of his career, it kind of took a, a left turn into more radical. Uh, he wasn't, I don't know if he's on the right side of history type cases. Um, but he tried to pro hoc into our case and the judge denied it because he did a quote unquote stand up routine like a week before we had to brief our response where he pulled his pants down and called an African-American person in the front row of the N-word, or said the N-word, knowing that there was only one African-American person. Um, and so we just like, exhibit A, uh, and the judge was like, at where we- That's, that's frowned upon. Yeah, apparently. Um, and so, yeah, Travis County, Judge Gamble was like, I'm not, we've had enough circus in this case, we're not bringing him in. So she denied his pro hoc. But then Andino Reynal, who is a Texas attorney who tried the case here, um, he used to be a federal prosecutor. Uh, Eric Holder appointed him as a U.S. attorney, and uh, which is, I think, ironic because he was in Laredo, and I'm pretty sure that was the division that was running the Fast and Furious program, the gun running drug cartel, which Alex has talked about on his show so many times. And then he hires the U.S. Att- former U.S. attorney. That was I was not charge. aware of that connection. I don't know if, if it was actually running out of that office or not, but I, I know that he was appointed by Holder. Hmm. Um, well, he pro hawked into the Connecticut case. And then three days before we tried our case, Pete, the world now knows um, that he had his, his office accidentally sent us his entire working file. Um, and then once we got it, we clicked on it. It was like 250 gigs. And by the folder names, we knew that this was work product. So we emailed him. We're like, hey, I don't think you meant to send us this. And he just said, uh, disregard. But the clawback statute requires very specific and certain things you have to do and identify to actually pull that back. He didn't do any of them. We had to wait 10 days. And so we were, we had two days left of trial. And then they said, Jones is taking the stand. And so Mark 
got up there and has probably the most famous uh, courtroom moment in this at least decade for sure when he got to say, you know, do you know what perjury is? And I, there's like, there's a couple of memes of me now going around the internet of, cause I'm like sitting there like smiling <laughs> and they're like, find you a guy who looks at you the way Bill looks at Mark when he's cross examining Alex Jones. <laughs> um, but we knew it was coming and we had to just sit and wait. And that was kind of, that was, it, g- it gave me anxiety just from the excitement of what was going to happen. And it played out. And you, Kyle Herbert, are the reason it all came out. How's that? Do you not know that? Well, so I know we, that I, I, I don't, I don't feel like I should take credit for this, and I don't, I, I don't want to appear not neutral as, as a modest reporter of the facts. But I, mean, I did talk a little bit with Mark about. Yeah, so I, re- I was, I was in the conversation, and we were talking. We, we have, you know, during trial, Jones is putting on images on his show of the judge on fire, um, linking her to child sex trafficking and all this stuff because she used to work for CPS, and we're like, how do we get this in? Like, how, how is it relevant? And Mr. Herbert chimes in with his cane at the time. I missed that. <laughs> and he says, he's like, well, just ask him if he's taking it seriously. And we were like, because he, throughout trial, he would show up late in the middle of testimony. He had like four bodyguards with him at all times. And they would make this kind of big scene for him to come in. And then he wouldn't even stay for the whole time. He'd leave. And then we'd all on our computer pull up and he'd go back to his studio and go on live. And, uh, and so that was our end. And, Mark says, are you taking this seriously? He's like, absolutely. And uh, we were like, oh, here we go. And so it's just rapid fire. And they're like, objection, your honor. We're not sure why, but this should definitely not be <laughs> It's devastating. It, it, one of the clips that we played, it's weird because like these get overlooked because of all of the crate. Like when Kyle Farah, my, our partner, did Owen Schroyer, it was just question after question bludgeoning. Um, Then Mark gets up and just destroys Alex. Everybody forgot that we got to play a video in front of the jury of the defendant calling the jury some blue collar simpletons that don't know what planet they're on, calling the judge a pedophile and calling our client who was in tears testifying about his son, calling him autistic. We got to play that to the jury and it's not, it's not even in the top five on the highlight reel because so many things, it was only a two week trial, but that was the most exhausting process of all time because Every single day, you had to listen intently to every single word because something crazy was going to come out, and it did. So it was it was super exhausting, but it was super fun. So before we move on to another topic, just real briefly, what is what is next? Just pending sanctions motions, waiting for that stuff to work its way through, and then. So they filed a motion for new trial literally last night. Um, I don't know how timely it is, but we'll let the smart lawyers deal with that, which is Mark. Um, They've got one pending motion for sanctions. We're waiting to set that for hearing. And then I'm assuming probably going to face another motion for sanctions for the brief that they just filed because it's just not true. Hmm. Um, and then Andino Reynal, who pro hoc into Connecticut, got show cause order to appear there for disclosing all the mental health records of the Connecticut plaintiffs to us in violation of their protective order. And the judge actually uh, suspended his license for three months, only in Connecticut, but if he's got to disclose that, I believe, on any pro hocs he does moving forward, and it's going to go on his record and stuff. So, um, and then I think Norm lost his Norm Pattis lost his for six months, I believe. Oof. And he's a he's a Connecticut lawyer, so um, yeah, they did not. They Connecticut definitely does not uh, take lightly when you give up uh, plaintiffs' mental health records, especially in a case like that. Hmm. Interesting stuff. So, Peter and I also wanted to talk. You you've got a, a recent verdict, uh, more local. Uh, about a gun discharge murder case. We don't use the M word. Sorry. Uh, I, well, um, for my purposes of what is a current ongoing deck action, it was a case. Did the defendant get convicted of murder? Absolutely. But the civil case beat the criminal case. And so because of that, they had to plead the fifth and didn't get to put on any evidence of intentional or murder. And so the only thing I pled was negligent discharge of a firearm within city limits uh, because Don Kidd, who's a plaintiff's lawyer in Houston, uh, gave me the idea and the case name of a case that says you can use any criminal criminal or civil statute as a standard for negligence. So you've jumped a little bit ahead. Yep. Tell me and Peter just the basic facts of what happened and then tell us how you pled it and, and how it happened. Okay, so uh, defendant and and my plaintiff, the surviving 
uh, beneficiaries of my plaintiff live next door. Uh, the deceased Anna Weed helped her neighbor, the female wife, who I understand it to be she was being held captive um, to an extent by her husband, helped her and her child get to the airport to go home to her family in Mexico. And they did that. And then six to eight months go by. And it was as if the, na- the, the husband was just waiting for his opportunity. Anna Weed was wrapping presents in her garage. Um, she, her dog got out of the house, ran into his yard. She walked over there, grabbed him. He, the, the defendant came out confronted her. She got the dog, pulled her back onto her property. So she was on her property line and he had walked out of his yard across his yard and was still on his. He pulled a gun and shot her through the neck collar. She had just had a two level fusion um, and she died pretty much instantly. And so, so you've uh, got like this neighbor to neighbor dispute for whatever reason sounds like. And one of the neighbors takes justice into his own hands or perceivedly so and discharges a weapon into his neighbor within the city limits. Okay. So to me and Peter's simple legal minds, that sounds like yep, an intentional tort. A hundred percent does, but, but tell us the rest of the story. So I was uh, talking with Don kid who's a plaintiff's lawyer here in Houston and he gave me, he said, there's a case that you can use any civil or criminal statute as a standard for negligence. So I just looked up the, the municipal code that says you can't discharge a firearm within the city of Houston. And I cited it in my petition and said, this is a wrongful death case for the negligent discharge of a firearm within city limits. And the plaintiff was a foreseeable person to be harmed by that statute. And which te- it's not untrue. It stretches a little, it doesn't really stretch, but it leaves out a lot of facts. Um, but the original lawyer was his criminal defense lawyer before his homeowner's insurance policy gave him counsel to cover him. And, uh, I did his deposition. He pled the fifth to everything, including what is, what size shoe he wore. I mean, I, I asked him, I strategically asked him questions that he should have answered knowing he was going to plead the fifth, setting up a motion for sanctions of course, as to my advantage, uh, they, the, the defense didn't depose any of my clients, the, the husband of the deceased, the son of the deceased or the mom of the deceased, and, uh, didn't, didn't depose the one eyewitness who saw everything happening, uh, when he was working in his garage and he actually pulled his gun. Everybody in the neighborhood had weapons. So the, when, as I understand it, the only thing that can stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. I think there's good people on both sides. Um, no, I'm not, without getting into whether or not <laughs> there's too many guns or the gun issue. Um, the neighbor pulls his gun from his shelf in his garage. He runs over uh, and there's and another neighbor started videoing. So there's a video of him with his hand on the entry wound, a gun on the defendant. Husband comes down because he was upstairs taking a nap. He starts giving aid. He's He's got his weapon too. And, um, and the defendant puts his gun, goes back inside, puts his gun down, walks outside, waits for the police, gets down on all on his knees and and surrenders. Um, he's charged with murder and then hurricane Harvey hit, which backed up everything because we lost this criminal courthouse here in Houston. And then they, you know, people's freedom comes before people's money. So they got to use our civil courthouse and then COVID hit. So we had these Thing, these these two events that stalled everybody's trial schedules, and we were sta- we were in front of Judge Sapolio. He he allowed discovery to go forward, but did not. He stayed the trial setting, and we had a status conference after at the beginning, probably February twenty twenty one. We had a status conference, and I pulled the docket sheet from the criminal case, and the defendant's lawyers were the ones that had asked for the last three resets, and so I gave that to judge Sapolio and said, my client's seventh amendment is being violated now. And he agreed. He set us for trial and we, tr- we got to try the civil case 31 days before the criminal trial. And the gist of the civil case is this joker negligently discharged a firearm within city limits, which is a violation of municipal code. And therefore his homeowner's policy should cover that negligence. Is that right? That is correct. Homeowner's policies cover negligence. And so you go down, you try the case. Tell us about the trial and what the verdict was. 
tried the case in two days. It was first witness I called was the defendant because I knew he couldn't testify. He's not going to let, he's not going to try to protect his homeowner's insurance company versus his freedom. And he knew, and he knew when his criminal trial was, we, we knew, and actually the jury found out. So I called him first. He pled, he had to plead the fifth to every single question was pursuant to my counsel. I, you know, I assert my fifth amendment right to silence and all that stuff. So pleads the fifth and jury's already like, okay, what's that all about? And then, um, I put on all three of my clients that were the wrongful death beneficiaries. I put on, uh, the eyewitness and then I rested my case. There, there wasn't much to cross my clients on one because they didn't depose my clients. So they didn't know what we were going to say. Um, but two, how do you, I mean, from a defense perspective, the defense counsel was Clay White. And I have a lot of respect for Clay because he was put in a really tough spot. I don't imagine that he gets a lot of cases like this, which is, you know, for, I don't know, including jury selection and, and debate for four days, he had to sit and next to a guy who had outside the courtroom admitted that he shot her on purpose. He said he claiming self-defense. Um, and so he tried it in a very, uh, delicate way. He was, he, he didn't push the limit and he knew he couldn't. And he, so I, I have a lot of respect for Clay, but he was put in a tough spot. The, uh, but prior to trial, the def- before Clay White got involved, the defense lawyer allowed his client to go on Dr. Phil and they did a full on episode. It's like 45 minutes. And when my clients found out this is before they hired me, they wanted to put their side of the story out and protect their, their loved one's name. And so they actually did the interview too. And so in that interview, the defendant says like, I was fearing for my life and I shot her on purpose. And so that was a tough piece of evidence to keep out it wasn't tough for me to keep it out. It was a tough, it was a tough piece of evidence for the defense not to get to use because one, it hangs their client, but two, it crushes their carrier if they don't use it because the, you know, you can protect the carrier or the client and, and clay. Well, well, are you, are you saying that there might be a conflict between insurance companies getting to hire lawyers from inside their company to defend? I'm definitely not saying that. I'm not saying there might be, there definitely is. (laughs) So yeah. So I am not saying there might be a conflict. There definitely is. Well, the Supreme Um, court's going to disagree with you there, Ted. They did. And and I will say this, you know, the defense counsel protected his client. Um, so we get the jury. I asked in closing arguments, asked for 50 million bucks and real, real quick. Yeah. I'm always fascinated how lawyers decide how to argue damages. Now you've got pretty weird facts. Did you just roll it out there and say, I want 50 million bucks? I didn't. So I had, I had a lot of lines. So I had past mental anguish, future mental, mental anguish, past consortium, future consortium. I, so I had each person had like five lines. And so I started filling them out when I was doing my clothes during lunch. And the first By round, lines, you mean lines on the jury charge. Lines on the jury charge, right. Gotcha. And by the time I filled out each one with with numbers that I was going to put, it was like 150 million bucks. And I was like, I can't ask for that. I was like, I feel like if you're going to ask for that, your trial has to be at least three days. So um, 50 million bucks a day. That's my rule of thumb. So I started playing with it and I was going to ask for 40 million and I had the numbers all done. I get into close, which happens every time I've closed, I black out completely. The, whatever outline I had, I've thrown out the window. I'm shooting from the hip and I'm just kind of in the moment feeling how the jury is receptive to it. So I start throwing out numbers. I know a couple of them are bigger than, than what I had practiced. And so I get done, Kyle Farrow, my, one of the partners at our firm, uh, he was watching and I look at him, I was like, Hey, I don't even know how much I asked for. And he's like, dude, you asked for 50 million. I'm like, perfect. And jury deliberated for I don't know, three hours and came back and gave me 70 million. So they affirmed that I did a really good job trying the case, but I'm horrible at valuing my cases. So we all have this. We all have our limitations. Did the defendant put on any witnesses or any evidence? No, they their defense pretty much relied on crossing the eyewitness who was the only um, non-interested party. And they it wasn't completely ineffective, but at, by the time we got, he was the last witness. So by the time we got to him, jury was already, you know, 
hanging it up and ready to give me, you know, whatever. What was the angle on cross? What was he trying to establish? His, on his angle of cross, he was pretty much trying to say, because the eyewitness heard some, some, some yelling and he walked to the end of his garage and looked across the street to watch. And then he saw what happened. So they were pretty much trying to say, use him to show that there was some sort of scuffle um, and that he was, you know, fearing for his life. And that they were trying to say that this like eight pound schnauzer was attacking uh, the defendant. And they, you know, when they, when he got done with the cross, I was like, I was a little worried and, it was enough to where Judge Sapolio allowed them to submit self-defense. The, the, they used the criminal affirmative defense of use of lethal force, um, which was at, at first I was I didn't know anything about it. And so the initial judge kicked it down the road and then Judge Sapolio took the bench and he used to be a prosecutor. So he knows all about it. And uh, and I think that's what made him comfortable trying that a case without affirmative defense with the criminal case kind of hanging in the background. So, so the criminal case came down though, was tried, was tried 31 days later, 45 years. Uh, he was probably 50 already. So yeah, for, yeah, he got uh, convicted of first degree murder. So our lawyer listeners are going to know this, that, uh, you may have won the battle, but could lose the war. The point being you've sued on a negligence standard, uh, for what appears to most folks as an intentional tort. So your words, not mine. My, absolutely, my words. Don't, and I don't want to put those in your mouth. But um, obviously, you've not been paid on this case. What What are the parties going to argue now, uh, or what do you expect you're going to argue about now? So prior to trial, they blew two stowers. I I stowers them. They tell me reservation rights go, you know, pounds hand. And then closer to trial, restowers, same response. So stowers means. If a defense, if a defendant carrier decides to not defendant carrier, if a carrier decides to not pay a claim and then they get popped at trial, that carrier is on the hook for whatever damages inure to the detriment of the client. Basically. Correct. Okay. So, your insurance company, pay, if you, if if a plaintiff gives your insurance carrier the opportunity to pay within the policy limits, um, and it's apparent that they should and they don't then whatever a jury gives, the defendant carrier is on the hook for. And so you invoked that doctrine and they told you to go pound sand. Yep. And so theoretically, the insurance company could be on the hook. Now, I've had one or two cases where there was coverage in play and insurance companies, most folks know this, are not super excited to just hand out cash. It's crazy to me. Yeah, weird. So what are they what are they going to say about your verdict? How are they going to argue that it should not be paid to one Bill Ogden and or client? So they hire we you know I hired a coverage expert, a lawyer who deals in coverage. And cuz that's out of my wheelhouse and I'm I like to think I'm smart because I know I'm not smart enough for certain areas. So uh, they didn't appeal the verdict, they just filed a declaration act, a declaratory judgment uh, action saying that their coverage does not apply here. The pro- their angle is going to be, he did it. He meant to do it. And uh, we, you know, we've got these affidavits. They went after the trial and while he was in prison and got him to sign affidavits saying that he intentionally did it. Um, but the, the problem is that I, cre- and when I gave all the facts, when I started giving facts to the coverage lawyers who I've used in a couple other cases, who's your coverage counsel? Warren, uh, uh, Warren Taylor. Yep. And he's fantastic. So, um, when I gave him the facts, he's like, I don't like it. I don't like, nope, absolutely not. And then I gave, and then I said, just read my petition. So I sent him the petition and he called me back and he's like, this is genius. He's like, I don't know if it's a win, <laughs> but he's like, this is very gen- This is a very smart way to have gone about this. And again, was not my idea. Um, I steal from everybody. And I, uh, and so he's like, with these facts, the way you pled it and the evidence that the jury got, I think we got a coin flip on whether or not coverage applies, maybe better than a coin flip. So I was like, I'm excited because when the case came in, uh, one of the partners at our firm who will not be named was like, that's intake error. You're going to hate yourself if you take it. And it didn't cost me anything to try because it cost me one depot and a filing fee. And, uh, and so and I tried the case just by myself. I actually tried the case. Our, we, we hired a law clerk and she helped me pick the jury. And that was, uh, 
it was, that was her first day on the gig. And so I was like, don't get used to this. $70 million breaks don't happen very often. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, I, everybody was like, dude, that's intake air. And it didn't cost me anything. And as long as it wasn't costing me anything, I might as well go try one. And, uh, I knew from the beginning, the stretch that I was making, especially when they decided to, uh, to do it under reservation of rights and blow the Stowers letter that I sent. So I, uh, yeah, it was, what could they have paid? Like, what was the Stowers? The, 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 the insurance policy is 300 or 500 grand. They so, could have paid a half million. Yeah. So is the underlying case, is there a final judgment been entered? Yes. How much is that with interest and all that? 80, uh, wait, no. Yeah, 81 million with interest. Uh, and interest is still running. So I don't know what it is today, but it was 81 million in September of last year. And is the, have they appealed that? No, and they and, didn't. And, and that's it's beyond, this, it beyond is. the timeline to appeal? Correct. So instead of appealing, they just filed the, the deck action and that's where they wanted to have their battle which I frankly was smart. I think with the defense that they put on, it'd be hard to argue any of, the, of what the jury gave me was unreasonable because they didn't really, they were handcuffed to not be able to give a defense. So hmm. they're, they're, in a, they're in a tough place. It's farmers. So shout out to farmers. I mean, who here hasn't gotten an excess verdict against farmers? Right. Well, I, I hadn't yet. Not Hopefully me. I get the big one. I'm asking just rhetorical. Oh, just, that's okay. just purely rhetorical. Uh, so let me Bill. you know, Thanks for all the super interesting stuff. You, I mean, you handle cases that the normal lawyer doesn't see in a 10 year period or 20 year period. You, you've handled a bunch of them, but I hear you, uh, you are resi- you're going to res- retire. Is that, is that right? Hoping to. My goal is uh, before my 37th birthday. I'm 35 right now. So, well, so to all the clients out there, you've got what, another year and a half, two years to hire Bill? Uh, I'll still keep bringing cases in. I'm sure I'll get bored and want to try cases. I just, you know, the being a plant lawyer is stressful. Um, you got to walk around like your shit doesn't stink because, and you got to do it 24 seven because nobody wants to like, Oh, I've got this $10 million case. Let me give it to that guy over there. That's self-aware and knows he makes mistakes. Like nobody does that. You want the guy that's perfect always, which doesn't exist, but we have to walk around, you know, especially when you're looking at referral lawyers and, and different sources of business, you have to walk around like you don't. And I realized that that switch is actually really hard to turn off. And so <laughs> once I started losing friends, cause they were like, dude, you're just, you know, you're a dick. And I'm like, sorry, like I'm not trying to be. And so I really, I, I learned after a few years how to turn it on and off, but it's, you know, our game is just a rat race of, you know, the hardest part about our, our business is getting it, getting the case is the hardest part of the case. It's the hardest part. Trying a case is tough, but it's not harder than actually getting big cases. And then you've got to compete with, lawyers whose pedigrees are way better, especially me. I, this is my 10th year practicing. I'm pretty young as far as the profession. And I was fortunate enough to work for two guys that were dumb enough to throw me in the deep end and let me do cases I had no business doing. Um, but they, they taught me the right way to do them and they taught me how to do them aggressively. And they, we had, I remember uh, Wes Ball gave me three rules when he, fa- nobody told Wes Ball that they hired me. And so he thought I was the IT guy for like six months. And, uh, and so when he found out that I was a lawyer and they hired me, he walked in and he said, there's three rules. Don't ever lie to me. Don't ever uh, make the same mistake twice. And don't ever take shit from defense counsel. Those are the three rules at our firm. And I've given those rules to the associates that have come. Now I'm not the young bucks. So I don't have to deal with all the craziness of that. But that's what I tell everybody that we hire is those, those, those are the three rules of our firm. And, they, and everybody at our firm is, if you've got a question, you better ask. Because if you don't, we're going to be way more pissed when you make that mistake. So I, uh, but yeah, I, I got licensed and two weeks later, I took an expert depot in a federal court case. It was a chiropractor. I refused to call him doctor. I just called him Lance. And, uh, and he was, you know, doing all these crazy, he had these uh, LED light pads that he was strapping on people's feet to cure neuropathy for diabetic people, which didn't. It ended up burning somebody's heel and he was in construction. He can't feel your feet and you got a burn on your heel. You're just going to walk on it and walk on it. And he got this horrible infection. They had to amputate his foot. But I took that. We got poured out in front of the honorable judge Hittner and, uh, and went up to the fifth circuit, made some really great law for plaintiffs lawyers on, on what experts can and can't say and uh, got kicked back down. But I had no idea that, that my first depot was going to be on that scale. And uh, nobody read it for a while. 
because the case was just kind of in the middle of discovery. And then once we started prepping for trial, they were like, wow, this is actually really good. I was like, good for me because I did not know what I was doing to an extent. And, and that's not really false modesty. Like mm. I've known you for five, 10 years. You're, you're really not that bright. I'm not. I, I will say this. I am, I'm yet to be in a room where I'm the smartest person. But I know today might be be the day. exception. This yeah, could I, be the day. We got a Navy SEAL over here. That's there's true. No, there's no way that I'm the smartest guy. <laughs> um, but no, I I I was at an average. I was below average student in high school. Wanted to join the military, but my parents didn't co-sign because I graduated high school at 17, and they were like, "No," and I hated them for it. But now I'm like, "Oh man, thank you." So I went to went to Sam Houston State and realized I definitely wasn't smart and then, but I tried and you just have to try a little there to get good grades and then went to law school. And then I really realized what I had to learn how to study at that point. So, but yeah, no, I've never, I've always been humble. I'm not smarter than anyone, but or for most people, but if you, if you want to have a conversation in front of a group of people, everyone will walk away from that conversation for the most part, thinking I'm smarter and definitely liking me more. You're also pretty tall. Yeah, I'm 6'4". It doesn't hurt. It does not hurt. I would give up probably 20 IQ points to to be like two inches taller. It's a, two inches is a lot these days. So what, what did you do in between uh, undergrad and law school? I went straight in. Okay. Um, yeah, I went straight in, uh, went to South Texas. And then I didn't even want to be a lawyer when I was going. I just realized I was graduating college. I made straight A's because I just went to class. And... Uh, and I just wasn't ready for a real job yet. Uh, so I was, I took the GMAT or the GRE, whatever the, whatever the, um, graduate school studies, um, exam is. And then I took the LSAT and I did okay. And South Texas offered me a little bit of money to go there. So I went to South Texas college of law and the first year was horrific. I hated it. And then I got into the advocacy program and I got pretty good at it. And I, I realized like, Hey, I can do this. I, I, I'm not going to beat anybody in an essay writing competition, but I can, if I'm talking, I definitely can. I'm, I, my quick wit is what saves me. I think in most parts from my, you know, the burdens of what my intelligence are. I think a lot, there've been a lot of uh, marginal students who came out of the South Texas advocacy program to make a pretty good living. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think in most law schools, I think you're, you know, the, everybody's law libraries are named after C students because they were plaintiff's lawyers. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer because I wanted to try cases all the time. And I worked for kind of a high profile criminal defense lawyer. I'm not going to talk about. Um, and I was, I did not enjoy that um, experience. And, uh, my last year of law school, I got a friend of mine was working for the, the firm I'm with now. And she said, I want to be a divorce lawyer. I was like, Oof. and, uh, so she was like, are you interested? And she asked me and the valedictorian of our class. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm definitely interested. And he was like, no, I've already accepted uh, summer associate gigs making like 30 grand this year at big law firms. And so, uh, yeah, Mark Bankston, who y'all have heard from before, uh, hired me without asking anybody as a clerk. And then, uh, yeah, Kyle, two weeks before my bar results were coming in, uh, they asked me, you know, do you want to, Hey Bill, come to lunch with us. And I didn't get invited to lunch until then. And then when one of the, the other lawyer at the table went to the bathroom, Kyle was like, Hey, all right, I'm going to offer you the gig, but you got to pass the bar because we need you now. What do you want for money? And I'm like, it's not prepared to talk about this at all. Um, you said but, anything in American dollars are fine with me. I forget what it was, but he said a number. I said a substantially higher number. And then I said, let's meet in the middle. And I did not use the midpoint. I used the point that was higher than that. And he said. Because lawyers are terrible at math. And yeah, very much so. Um, that's why you have to have a good bookkeeper. Shout out to Debbie, even though we have our differences. <laughs> Come on, Deb. <laughs> Well, uh, Bill, super interesting. Thanks for joining us. We are going to talk about some other cases that have nothing to do with you and probably nothing to do with me and Peter. But if you've got time and want to hang out and chat with us a little bit more, sure. we'd love to hear your thoughts on a couple of uh, other kind of themes and ideas uh, around the legal world. Fair enough? Thanks for joining us this week at the Dirty Verdict Podcast. For links to some of the stories discussed today, please visit our website www.dirtyverdict.com If you have obtained a recent verdict and want us to discuss it, please email details on the verdict to us at Also, please follow us wherever you get your podcasts.